Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's uh, Q&A discussion with Director uh, Brooke Sweeney and our lead, as well, uh, Kendra Milinchuk potter um, So today brought us together, they brought us the touching film, Daughter of a Lost Bird, a documentary film, which has played at a number of festivals, premiered at Maryland, Hot Docs, the New York Human Rights Watch Festival, Biff and Woodstock, and it's just had such a great festival run. We're so happy to have it here at Imaginative. My name is Nikki Little, and I'm the artistic director here, and I have chin, orange chin length hair and brown eyes, and today I'm wearing uh, turquoise tombstone earrings, a navy shirt with a cowboy silver uh, silver cowboy necklace, and I'm sitting in the Imaginative office with white walls behind me. And today I welcome Blackfeet Salish filmmaker Brooke Sweeney and their collaborator and lead in the film, Kendra, as I mentioned. Welcome, and how are you both doing today? Hello, Nikki. Well, it's really great to be here, and you know, I so wish that we could all be in person, but this is a really lovely substitute. So thank you for having us. Amazing. How are you doing, Kendra? Hi, I'm well. I'm grateful to be here as well. Thank you so much for uh, giving this film a platform and giving us an opportunity to discuss it. Well, we're very happy to. So I was wondering if you both wouldn't mind actually just giving our audiences a little bit of insight into your practice and perhaps where you're tuning in today. As you may have noticed, I described um, sort of my physical description and if you could include that as well for um, some of our visually impaired folks. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, so I'm Brooke Swainey. I'm speaking currently. Um, I'm wearing a burgundy sweater with beaded hoop earrings by this amazing Salish elder, Linda King. Um, I'm wearing, or I have very long brown hair and behind me is a picture of Kendra and April the first time that they met. And I'm calling in from um, the Flathead Reservation home to the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes, which is where my mom is from. And uh, my name is Kendra Milnachuk Potter. I am wearing a brown turtleneck and some cream colored beaded earrings from Letitia Black Elk Thunder. Uh, I have a blurry background, long brown hair and bangs. And I'm calling in from Missoula, Montana, the unceded lands of the Salish and Kootenai people. Oh, welcome, thank you so much. I do love though how few people are naming their makers of their earrings. It's really nice um, just to be able to name some folks from home or wherever you got them. And I think just being able to amplify those beaters as well. Um, so I was wondering if we could maybe just start. Um, oh, actually, I have to I'm going to want to remind the audiences that you can ask a question in the chat to in the chat box there. And Caitlin, my lovely uh, programming coordinator, will uh, relay the messages to us. So I was wondering if we could start perhaps at the beginning of this uh, collaboration between you two. Um, and Kendra, I know you had been a part of Brooke's previous work and sort of just the evolution to where we came um, with this film, because it's actually shot over seven years. And there's a lot of wonderful things I think that come through, like such as the ethics of your collaboration, um, your, your relationship together, and um, just that trust that you had to build. <laughs> um, so I'd like to say that Kendra and I became friends over our first collaboration, um, making a short film called OK Breathe Orally. And, um, you know, aside from being an amazingly talented actress, um, I just, we just gravitated towards one another as people and um, became friends. And through making that film, I, there were like somewhere along the way, I realized like, Kendra doesn't know where she comes from. Um, I, I wrote this role with her in mind, but I had no idea actually that, you know, her character story and her actual story had so many similarities. And so um, as her friend, I like naively was like, well, let's just find out, you know, um, you know, when you're younger, you kind of make <laughs> these, these grand statements and they don't seem like such a big deal, but you know, it's a pretty big deal. So, um, so over, over time, you know, I feel like when I commit to something, I really want to see it through. And so 
um, committing myself to that relationship with Kendra and her, her journey, you know, I just feel like I was kind of her partner in that way, you know, to just like be with her as she, she went through that journey. Yeah. And we, um, I mean, I, I learned a lot from making that short film. Okay. Breathe early. And then we, we had sort of talked about making a documentary, uh, about my journey and I wasn't, it was kind of like this floating idea until I got pregnant with my daughter, Suka. And then once once I discovered that she was coming and, um, or that someone was coming, uh, I was much more inclined to find out more about where I came from so that I could answer those questions for my children or so that they wouldn't be living in my children's psyche in the same way that they had lived in mine. So we started in earnest uh, making the film at the tail end of my pregnancy. Actually, the first scenes that we shot were at my baby shower and, um, and then progressed forward to that opening scene where I was calling my birth mother was actually a couple of years down the road. So um, yeah, it was, I mean, it, it was, pretty organic, the process of deciding to make the film together. And then uh, it sort of, you know, snowballed into this epic project. Mm -hmm. And I can imagine, you know, um, coming into this idea and sort of, you know, there's the idea of maybe your own interpretation of what might happen, but then the reality is sort of set in. Um, and I did appreciate so how honest it did feel on camera as well, like through the narration and through just your, your relationship, you can see that uh, like reveal itself to the audience as we're watching. And I was just wondering, uh, Brooke, if you could talk about, you know, the choice of putting your na narration within within the film itself, because it felt so honest and it felt like, you know, like that self-awareness that, you know, we, that I think is so important. Sure. Um, well, actually I would have to say that Kendra really pushed me to put in, you know, my perspective on the whole story. Um, we had tried for a long time to, you know, really kind of keep my perspective out of the story. Um, but it became clear to me, especially after talking to the other members of our creative team, Kristen, my amazing editor, Gita, our amazing executive producer, Jerry, my amazing producer, that, you know, we, we needed to have like my contextualization because, you know, the lens through which we're showing the story is not just an objective one. There is some subjectivity, right? Um, so, uh, so adding that voiceover was pretty crucial in, in the way that we framed the story. Um, and I'm, I'm glad that, you know, we ended up doing that. We actually have two versions of the film where I, I come in and speak, you know, in the history section. Um, but then we pulled like all of that voiceover out and that was like, an attempt to make it shorter <laughs> and that that version you know we're still in the sales and whatnot but that version like nobody wanted that one so everybody wanted the one where you know I'm I'm giving some sort of context and perspective that's what I really do appreciate you sharing sort of like the collaboration there like sort of the openness and the trust that you have to talk to each other through these ideas and these different notions is so important when you're you know, not only friends embarking on a project, but, you know, in such an intimate portrayal uh, of, the, of a self journey, you know, um, and it, it is, it really resonated with the programming team, um, you know, some of the assimilation, uh, I guess, practices and policies echoed some of the, the histories in Canada too. And I was wondering um, if it's not too, I guess, in like vulnerable space or, or anything, but how was it for you, Kendra? Like in that, at the opening scenes also, it's just like the call, we, I felt it. I was just like there with you, um, the anticipation. And then when you cut to, um, you know, uh, the, the first chapter, if you will, I, I was just there with you, if you don't mind talking about that. Oh, sure. Um, yeah, it felt really, uh, essential right that we were that we had the cameras there for that phone call and I I really wanted to 
share as much of the process as possible. I mean, those are the the moments that, you know, I didn't ever know if I would have an opportunity to uh, get in my life. And it was such a gift that, you know, when we, we shot the beginning of the phone call and then I initially was on the phone with, with April. Um, and I think it was a couple of minutes into our conversation that I said, by the way, I'm recording this conversation. Do you mind if I put you on speaker? And she was like, oh my gosh, of course. And, you know, and I, um, explained what the project was and, and offered and told her, you know, I would be talking about my experience with our conversations, but she wasn't by any means required to participate. Mm -hmm. And we were so, so fortunate to have her be such an open book as well. And, um, and I feel like her story and her life experience um, gave, in addition to like, my, you know, the gift that I have of having this relationship yeah. with this magnificent woman, also um, for, the, for the benefits of the story and um, of the film gave us so much more, um, like, a, like a wider net of, of experience to be able to speak from my experience being two generations removed, her experience being one generation removed and, um, and sharing that journey was, was really, I, I mean, I really, I can't believe how lucky we were to have how, how open and willing she is to uh, participate. Because obviously yeah. when we started the film, we had no idea that that was going to be an element. Um, and I think, yeah, yeah. And I think like the, the generational aspect that you spoke to was so, you know, even where, where you were in, in welcoming a new little person into your world, um, that generally generational aspect is so important, I think, to also be able to understand the nuances that you talked about in the film of like where each generation and how it affects that generation because it's you know it's different we can look back and be like oh well that like put our own biases on it but I really appreciated how um honest it was uh and how April was you know really open to talking about it and um especially you know as you journeyed home uh to your homelands um that experience of going home and seeing also the, the context of like your community and your kin around and how um that, that relationship was so thank you for bringing all of those elements in there it was really wonderful um so Brooke, I have a, a bit of a two-part question for you. Um, you have Laura Ortman, uh, which I recognize right away <laughs> from uh, the sound. And you also have such a powerhouse team. I saw Sky was in there as well. Um, I was wondering how you became to build or bring together this collective of, of amazing artists. And then also if you could speak to your um, both visual and uh, audio choices uh within the film there it's like all so stunning and um in you know yeah go ahead <laughs> <laughs> um well i'll start with laura ortman so i've known laura since my new york days um i went to graduate film school at new york university um along with um a really great friend of mine sally kiwayosh and um you know we just were kind of palling around together back in those days um i moved back home later but you know i've stayed in touch with laura over the years and um i mean just as an artist she's incredible and when we reached out to her about doing the music um because she also scored this you know other short film that kendra and i made together um she was really excited to collaborate with us and I couldn't imagine anybody else doing the score, um, you know, because Laura has some, um, some, some affinity of her own to the story, you know. Um, and then with regards to Sky, I mean, I think we met through like so a mutual friend um, years back, like many years before he, like I like to call, became fancy. Um, <laughs> so, so he uh, he was doing like some sort of language immersion thing um, with a friend up here, and um, and and we became friends over 
over that. Um, and knowing that he grew up on the Lummi reservation um, and knowing that he knew so many community members, it was really important to me. You know, native people were relational. And so making sure that we're in good relation with other communities who are not our own um, has always been a, a big thing for me. And I feel like over time, I mean, I'm still learning how you can best like work with other communities. Um, you know, the Lummi community is not my community. And so, you know, we went through those protocols of trying to, to connect with people. Um, and now I guess like the third part of the question um, is uh, like an artistic approach to the film. I mean, it's always been about like that intimacy, I guess. Um, and I don't think that I do it subconsciously. And, you know, oftentimes it's kind of, you know, some of what the, what the film ended up being is like, uh, is like kind of this amazing, you know, uh, eye that my editor has, um, cause she also, you know, shoots stuff um, from time to time and actually shot part of the film. I mean, I shot part of the film, I'm not a shooter, um, but it, depending on, you know, where we were as far as our budget and, you know, if things were happening really fast and we couldn't, you know, find somebody. Um, I mean, we shot a lot of it with this like, Canon DSLR that my producer Jerry Rafter had, you know, just because it was available to us. And I still hated Zoom recorders at the time and still have a lot of feelings about that and sound. <laughs> Some of the sound in the film could have been better, but, um, you know, uh, I was fortunate to work with another um, director of photography, Zalmira Gainza, who came and shot, um, you know, quite a few scenes with us, with us, especially, you know, when we went to Lummi for the first time. So, and, the, and those are all people that I know, you know, that I know well, and I feel like I have a relationship with them where I can tell them, you know, like, can you move the camera over here? And they don't get offended by me bossing them around. Yeah, it isn't like all the co-conspirators. I mean, my friends call when we collaborate. Um, and sorry, look, Kendra, you wanted to add? Well, I just, I feel like it's one of the things that was really, I, I mean, neither of us has ever made a documentary before. Um, you know, Brooke is a narrative filmmaker most of the time. But one of the things that I felt was really important about, I mean, as you'd mentioned a minute ago, Nikki, that the intimacy of the, the scenes or that we were able to, you know, have part of that, I think, was that the entire team was friends. I mean, no one, no one that was there was only there for a job. And mm -hmm. so it felt very, I felt very held. Um, and I think when April joined in on the filmmaking process, that was also, and I feel like that's a testament to Brooke's filmmaking capacity that, that she always made sure to create an environment that um, was incredibly safe and small um, so that things were, they, they didn't feel contrived. I mean, it felt a little weird at Lummi walking around with film crews, but besides that, um, that, that it was a team of, of friends. I appreciate that. And that's, I think that's, you know, at Imagine we do see that kinship system uh, expand and be able, people to be able to reconnect. And it's nice to hear sort of on a, a micro level, um, how that how that works and how that um, affects your practices. I was wondering if you could maybe talk a little bit about the archive. Um, you know, we have the archive of the American history of what has actually happened in those policies and um, the assimilation policies. And then we also have Brooke, we have, I mean, sorry, Kendra, we have your personal archive that's in there. Um, I was just wondering how it, what, how was it working with unpacking all of that and also just being able to articulate um, some of these moments. I do have to say, uh, Kendra, I loved your haircut at, when you were a little girl. I was like, <laughs> I want that haircut. I don't know if I can pull it off. But anyways, uh, if you could maybe take us through that. Well, I'll just, I'll just speak a little bit about um, Kendra's archival and if she wants to you know jump in I mean really I I just asked her and then she was like I know my parents have all these home videos that need to be digitized and so you know as the production like we cover you know we covered that and we covered you know like giving them a, a hard drive you know of their own 
to, 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 you know, cause it's their, it's their home video. Um, and they should be able to enjoy it when they want. Um, and, uh, the other elements of the archival, um, especially with regards to the historical footage, um, you know, when we started making the film, there weren't a lot of films about, um, about the issue of adoption with indigenous communities in the United States. Um, and then it was like, all of a sudden, like Dawnland came up and then there was also blood memory. And so, you know, we were able to, again, back to this relational thing, like talk to these other filmmakers and reach out to them and be like, you know, like, do you have any recommendations for us regarding archival um, and where we might be able to access some of that? So you know, our fellow filmmakers were a resource in that way. And then, um, you know, some of the archival at Lummi, which was really amazing, uh, that was all um, like our last production trip and which, you know, kind of turned into this interesting um, and amazing situation where we ended up filming like way more than we thought that we were, we were going to. Ke um, Kendra came up with us, you know, to, to, get access to the archives because it's her family's archives but we didn't realize that she needed to finish enrolling in order to access the archives so then we started filming the enroll or you know the scene at the enrollment office which i think is one of the most powerful moments in the film along with her uncle cheyenne and her birth mother april who also came up and you know we were just like asked we just asked them hey can you can you come cuz we have like a few more questions to ask you to like fill some gaps like in in as we edit and um and it just it just turned out to be this really amazing moment in the film and then Kendra if you want to talk about your family archival well with the family archival i i actually now that you're asking Nikki i haven't spoken to my extended family about their feelings being in the film. Uh, I, I hope they don't mind. Um, it it's a really weird and it yeah, it's a really weird thing to hand over your family's stories to an editor and then see, and and you know, I trusted and I still trust Kristen, our editor, implicitly, but really strange to hand all of this stuff over and then see what she pulls out and how she contextualizes it within the story. You know, there's like my cousins with the guns and the, you know, running around in the backyard and my uncle yelling like, this is your daughter, which I was like, um, there's, you know, the, the, the decontextualizing or recontextualizing story um, for, for the benefit of, of, you know, perpetuating this, this story of, or, or expanding on the story of uh, specifically looking through the lens of my identity as a native woman was strange. Um, and I think she did an excellent job and it was still strange uh, to see, you know, that that's the way that my family is viewed. Um, and the, yeah, I mean, it's it's all who who doesn't feel weird watching videos of themselves from the mid eighties. <laughs> yeah, I think I think so too, and especially at that time, you know, is uh, I know certainly in Canada, um, women just got their like identity back in terms in some ways um, through some advocacy, and just like that time is really you know, 60s and set like 70s, a lot of activism was happening, still a lot of activists in the 80s. And so there is a shift and there is a moment there that I think is important to see from, especially it would be surreal to see, like we didn't, I didn't have a camera, which is good for me, but, uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, it's surreal, I bet. Um, I was wondering actually, if you wouldn't mind just thinking about the generational and the aspect and now where you are in terms of just time, I suppose that's gone by, and reflecting uh, with your little ones. You have you had yeah. one you have one daughter that was featured in the film, and then I'm not sure if your family's grown, but I sort do, of just yeah, that relationship as well. Sure. So I have uh, my daughter Suka, who's in the film a fair amount, is now eight, and my son Lucian, who you actually see at the tail end of the film when April's singing to like a little baby. Um, and he is now four and they are, um, I, I mean, it worked, the goal worked for the most part of, 
having them have answers. They, they know where they come from. We went to Lummi or I went twice this summer. The kids came once and spent some time with my uncle Cheyenne and my aunt, um, on April's maternal side of the family, um, and met their great grandmother, April's birth mother. Um, Suka, every day, you know, every meal, we bless our food and we end our meal with Haishka, which is a uh, thank you to Creator in Clackamish. We're trying like tiny bits of language. Um, you know, we're trying, we're learning side by side, which is really lovely and sometimes very frustrating to my daughter that I don't know answers to her questions. Um, but we're incredibly fortunate to have now some relationships with relatives who have been unbelievably welcoming. And I recognize that that's not everybody's experience when they come back. Um, that's not everybody's experience to be embraced by their community or, or possibly their family doesn't have the capacity to be welcoming and available. And I'm, in, I'm incredibly fortunate to have a uh, come home and have had my relatives really, really welcoming and willing to answer all of the weird questions that come up when you have small children who want to know. Um, so we are, yeah, we're very much, you know, seeking to incorporate and I've made a commitment to the kids that, you know, we're going to go back at least once a year, um, hopefully more. That's phenomenal. And I do you know, sometimes I think about that generation, generational aspect and sort of that, that connection to community and who claims you as well and that you have to work at it and it's like a reciprocal experience and that's so beautiful and touching. Um, there was one moment, Brooke, I was wondering if you could, you spoke a little bit about to the protocols and being um, not from that community, but understanding sort of uh, the labor involved in, in being in those spaces especially listening to the tapes when we're in the car. I think for me, um, I just, I don't know, that moment just really struck with me. And, um, you know, we're listening to tapes, but then you also, um, we stop listening to the tape and you explain why, and you say that we actually can't, you know, fully hear this. And I just thought that was such a profound moment of just like an indigenous, like this is an indigenous film. And I just saw that there. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the protocols that you went, uh, you know, that you carry in your practice? Um, well, I mean, it's really important to me to respect what other people, you know, want. Uh, want. Um, uh, and actually we encountered um, an interesting, well, interesting is not the word for it, but um, we were having a little bit of a, a conundrum about what to do because one of the elders that had been in the film, um, passed away this summer and that was after we had some of our public screenings and you know Lummi people put away the pictures of their loved ones for at least a year and you know it, it depends from family to family you know how you know how much they're respecting that tradition but you know it was really important to us to you know to to communicate with them and find out what their wishes were and you know, Kendra, maybe you want to talk a little bit more about it, but because, um, Ken, you know, Kendra was really the person speaking with the family. Yeah, it's uh, learning new things. And the, the as Brooke mentioned, the tradition is to put the images away for a year. So we reached out and it was also th this particular uh, elder and, and his wife were incredibly supportive of me and of the film uh, while we were in the process of making it. So trying to find a way to reach out to, to the family while they were very freshly grieving to find out what was okay or what their preferences were was hard. Um, but the, it was made, you know, she communicated with through some children that her preference was that we remove his image and um, also names are not uttered for a year um, for families who are choosing to stay very, uh, or, or, you know, the, the tradition would be that, that, that you let them go. Um, so we, you know, went through and had another post 
pass to pull pull the image out and remove the name from the credits and um, the the process of learning how to be respectful and how to walk in a good way is uh, slow and continuous. But we were, you know, we're also, again, very fortunate that people have told us like gently, um, but, but made very sure that we knew, you know, like even the scene in the car where my great uncle was playing the, the song, that's a sacred family song. And I asked him if he would mind if we, if the cameras came into the car and he said, sure. And then when the song, when the family song came on, he turned around and he said, you can keep shooting, but you have to turn off the sound. This may not be recorded or no, he said, you can record it, but it can't be in the film. And then at the end of the film, when, uh, when April and I were wrapped in the ceremony, when we were wrapped in blankets, again, they said in the moment, we, you're welcome to continue to do video recording, but this, this song cannot be shared publicly. Um, so it's, it's much easier to follow protocol when you're told what the protocol is. Um, and I know for me, because I, I don't know what the, any of the protocols are, um, you know, I've had to rely very heavily on, on people gently letting us know. And fortunately, you know, Brooke, even though she's not Lummi, she is familiar that there will be protocol that needs to, you know, that it would be smart for us to be asking um, to be informed. And then, you know, whenever you're told that obviously the right thing to do is to respect it. Well, Brooke, you definitely, you definitely handle it with great care and um, for the story and for ever, all the communities involved. And, I, you know, the film's been out for a little while now. I was wondering if you had any reflections on, you know, now where you're at with, with the work and uh, have any final remarks for slowly coming to the end of our time here. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's been a really long journey. And certainly, you know, I have a perspective on the story that isn't you know, everybody else's perspective. Um, and something that I think, um, we, you know, we're gonna be trying to make a little bit more clear in um, subsequent screenings. And, you know, when we have a broadcast date is to clarify uh, Kendra's relationship to the Indian Child Welfare Act um, as a law, um, because people feel like we're, you know, kind of making this leap that we shouldn't be making. Um, but it's a con it's like the context surrounding their both April's life and Kendra's life um, that they're they they are situated in this history um, that you know these influences had I'm sure on their lives um, and while like specifically with Kendra's um, story the Indian Child Welfare Act actually didn't apply because you have to have paperwork in order to be claimed or, you know, recognized and governed under that act. Um, you know, the fact, the fact remains that there are still ways that indigenous kids can slip through the cracks and, you know, and there are still ways that people try to get around the law and certainly um, are still uh, challenging the law um, here in the United States. The law is currently, um, in front of the Supreme Court for I don't know, you know, how many times it's gone up, but you know, recently there was a decision um, that was really complicated, and um, there's some very powerful members um, of the you know political right who are challenging ICWA on the basis of race when it's about tribal sovereignty, and really what they're trying to do is to destroy tribes and get at the land. So. Um, that's, you know, that's, to me, that's like the most important thing um, for people to take away at the moment, and that, you know, Native kids have the right to be connected to their culture. Um, they have that right. That is their heritage. Thank you so much for sharing that, and it's so profoundly important, um, and it is, you know, you you do see the nuances and the history as they unravel through through all of uh, your family and your kin. And so thanks for sharing that. Kendra, do you have any final thoughts as well that you'd like to share? 
just deep gratitude. Yeah. Thank you so much. It's so wonderful to see uh, your connection and to also see it on screen and just the evolution of the film. And thank you so much for sharing it with us at Imaginative. Um, and just for the audiences out there, you do have 48 hours to watch and to access this work. Um, and don't forget also um, our Audience Choice Award for both feature and short length film are still open and available. So you can vote on the festival website. Um, thank you so much for joining me again. Congratulations. And we look forward to seeing more from you. Thank you. <laughs>